This is World Comics Review and it was that time again. <clears throat> time for the Spring Shutenogy book sale. This time it's not cancelled edition. It's also that time again in the sense that I've made so many uh, misspoken lines in the previous version of this video that I uh, would have had to have put in so many text annotations that I might as well just shoot the whole thing again. So here goes eh. Right, let's start off with uh, some of the least interesting parts of the haul. First one is this. It's um, Beda 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 Fuku Volume 1. This is actually um, by Smash Station. This is a uh, Japanese to English phrase book aimed at um, Japanese people who want to speak English, but obviously it works both ways. It's got this, um, oops. This blue thing to cover up the English so you can practice cover up the English and try and translate from the Japanese and then reveal what it is. And uh, the uh, kanji don't have furigana on them, which is like the little letters above that tell you how to read it, so you actually have to concentrate and study. This is a. Is that Honmaya? Is that a Kansai phrase? Honmaya? Are you serious? So yeah, that's uh, going to be useful for studying some. Uh, Studying some Japanese. This has been really dusty at one point, and the dust has kind of got um, integrated into it. And also, in the previous version of this video, I um, kept putting things like down here and talking about them, so yeah, try and keep them in the frame this time, eh? Right, that's that phrase book. Got a... This is quite interesting. It's the Underground Dictionary from, I believe, 19. slightly foxed, as you can see. 1971, I believe, and it's um like a dictionary for parents and teachers and the like to um understand the uh, oh yeah, 1971 understand the language of the various youth cultures like uh, bike gangs and uh, the gay scene and stuff like that and the hippies and drugs and stuff. So yeah, various uh, 70s slang that will be useful if I ever. I want to do a story set in early 70s uh, USA. I guess maybe I'll do something around the uh, the gay scene of the time and Stonewall and stuff like that at some point. Although obviously not from the uh, point of view of what you'd usually expect. Okay, onto the uh, badass paperbacks and uh, here's British paperback. This is Straw Dogs, which was made into a pretty infamous movie in uh, the UK in the 70s. It's about um. Uh, rich Americans who come to a um, kind of isolated British village and are really kind of patronising and annoying. And uh, yeah, made into a pretty infamous movie in the 70s that I saw a retrospective about once, which is uh, one of my first introductions to uh, Jermaine Greer and the phrase problematic, immediately uh, recognising my enemy. And I think I was still pretty left wing back then. Okay, now another paperback. This is. Um, some prefer nettles, which is a, originally a Japanese novel by Junichiro Tanizaki, but this is a, a English edition, originally published in sometime in the 50s, I believe. It's kind of a, I think it's set like early 20th century, late 19th century, like the um, Japan was opening up to the world, and some people were sticking to the old kimonos and stuff, and other people were more westernised with um, uh, like western style clothes and electric light and stuff. So uh, give that a read at some point. And uh, the last of the kind of factual books is this. This is Chop Suey, which is a um, a Singapore comic, kind of. So there's originally four. Chop Suey books. Uh, three were in English and Chinese and one was only in Chinese. It's a bunch of uh, cartoon illustrations by um, somebody whose name I've now, whoosh, name I've now forgotten. But um, yeah, basically this uh, guy was uh, interviewed people and uh, did these pictures documenting uh, the Japanese occupation and various war crimes and atrocities. I don't, know. I don't know what this is exactly. But yeah, like um, the drivers of military trucks didn't care if they ran people over. 
and things. This, uh, I guess this guy's been boiled in a big pan of water to make him talk and stuff like that. So um, these are all of the uh, cartoons of uh, Chop Suey, um, which was released in as three books in Singapore in the late 40s. And then actually the artist himself, and everyone kind of forgot about the, um, forgot about them, and then um, they were put in a museum. Well, three of them were put in a museum, and there's no actual copies of the Chinese version, so they had to use a photocopy of it. And then it got re-released as a book and translated into Japanese. So we got all the um, the uh, cartoons illustrating various war crimes, and then a long explanation at the back. And finally, uh, the artist's name, uh, Liu Kang. That's it. Liu Kang was the cartoonist who drew this, and then in the late 40s and then kind of forgot about it and then it was put in a museum and became famous again in uh, the 90s. Okay, that brings us on to the, uh, the Japanese things proper. So first is this one. This is uh, the manga Tokuhon, which is uh, kind of interesting from uh, September 1957. So this is kind of interesting. It seems to be Japanese translations of a uh, various newspaper cartoons from around the world. This is a, obviously a British one and a Spanish one, or one about Spain. Oh, yeah, this is Igirisu Sabine. And yeah, different um, newspaper cartoons from around the world translated into Japanese to show people kind of uh, what the different cartoonists around the world are saying about the things that are going on in their countries. And some actual, uh, actual proper comic strips as well. I think it's a mostly ones from Japan, but there's some international ones too. As an this Australian one by a uh, Kurt Fleming or Kurt Fleming, which is not a very Japanese sounding name. So it's got a kangaroo, so I'm guessing he's Australian. And uh, I think I saw some Blondie in here too. The uh, long-running American comic strip. And yeah, although I say it's many different um, cartoons from many different countries, you might notice they're all pretty much the same style. So uh, this is kind of a pretty ugly looking art style that was quite common in the late uh, 50s and late 50s, early 60s. This style, it even showed up in Eagle on occasion. So um, yeah, although these days we laugh at the likes of uh, Jamie Smart and oh, here's some Blondie. So yeah, these days we laugh at the likes of Jamie Smart and Erica Henderson, and um, even Narwhal. But uh, the 50s weren't all Frank Hampson and Frank Bellamy. They had their fair share of crap as well. And yeah, this kind of uh, this sort of style was pretty persistent around the entire world, it seems. And uh, yeah, you might think it's a bit weird that there's a, let's see a bookmark. That's, a, that's an old bookmark or something. This is like silvery, foily paper. I don't know what that is. <laughs> been left in there by somebody. So, um, yeah, you might think it's kind of weird that there's like a, this magazine of um, newspaper cartoons from around the world, but actually this isn't the only one. So uh, several years ago, on a short visit to Japan, I found another one just like this, but I'm sure it was called something else, and I bought that. So yeah, at one point there was actually two magazines showing um, different newspaper cartoons from around the world. But uh, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Manga Tokuhan from 1957. And uh, I didn't go and say it was from the 70s and not catch myself this time, so that was lucky. Right, what else have we got from Japan? Save the interesting ones to last. Um, we have, oh yeah. So you just saw some Blondie in that. So here's an entire book of Blondie translated into Japanese. I bought one of these last time too, but uh, at the present time, my previous haul video from the Shitanaji sale sits at zero views, so uh, no one's actually seen that. So, anyway, here's another one. So, this is um, Blondie translated into Japanese, and it is. Oh, yeah, some colour too. Just a few colour pages. But um, the speech balloons are translated into Japanese, but the original dialogue is underneath, so you can kind of use it for study or just uh, read it for entertainment. And uh, I don't know when this is from, but it seems to be 
from the 50s or 60s as well. Just looking at like um, possibly some of the actual strips are older from the 30s and 40s, like this old style fridge. That's well, probably one of the old kind of fridges where um, you actually have to put a big block of ice in it. So yeah, these are possibly um, books probably from the 50s or 60s. It like, cost 100 yen when it was new. So um, I'm pretty sure before the war, 100 yen was considerably more. But um, yeah, possibly some of the actual strips are older than ones from the 50s and 60s. I've just seen the date from Showa 25, so that would have been uh, 1950 actually, yeah. Yeah, it's just from 1950 and it appears to be book number seven. Right, so yeah, Blondie from 1950, possibly with some strips that are older than 1950. Although I guess maybe quite a few people in the USA still had the old kind of fridge you had to put the um, block of icing in 1950, the kind of electrical compressor kind were probably pretty new back then and still pretty expensive. Right, what else? We have the uh, the Youth's Companion with a, a nice painted cover of Cambridge and uh, actually missing the back cover. So this is from November 1954 and uh, actually in like maybe 1854 there was a um, a British publication called The Youth's Companion, but this is nothing like that apart from having Cambridge on the cover. So um, it's got Cambridge on the cover because uh, in that month a team of row rowers from Cambridge visited Japan and rowed in a few races against Japanese teams. So uh, this, and here's um, some pictures of them visiting around uh, Mount Nico National Park, which I went to in 2009. And there's a picture of a uh, Baker Street in the 1950s. So this is um this magazine's aimed at studying English. So we've got English sections and then Japanese translations, Japanese essays with explanations of um some of the phrases that are being used, or example sentences and things, and sections on famous uh, English and American writers. Uh, article about Royal Albert Hall and uh, there's an interview with the um, with the Cambridge rowers completely in English yeah here we are it's the uh, Cambridge rowing team talking about their experience of Japan and also this is a time when the Japanese self-defense force was first being built up so they're talking about what do you think about Japan rearming and uh they're saying that there's a lot of uh, communist revolutions going on around China and Southeast Asia, so Japan needs to protect herself. And further on, there's like a mini English newspaper. Here we are. Mini English newspaper, the YC Times, talking about um, communist China raiding a bit of Taiwanese territory. And uh, they call Beijing Peiping and Taipei is Taipei and uh, some other small small articles and one about um, uh, President Eisenhower banning the uh, American Communist Party some cartoons as well with English captions and uh, some uh, corrections of both English and Japanese showing uh, mistakes people have made I don't know if readers maybe sent these in and uh, the editors correct them and explain the mistakes. And uh, there's a old subscription for me here as well. So yeah, unfortunately missing the back cover. It still costs 500 yen, but um, yeah, it's the uh, Youth's Companion of November 1954. For a very nice cover. Got to find some more of these if they're all up to the same standard. Oh, possible bias because I come from Cambridge as well, but never mind. Right, let's, um, okay, the interesting things to me anyway, we have two issues of Fuji, which is obviously the, um, was the wartime name of King, Japan's most popular magazine of the time. So this one is from Lokugetsu 
Sho wa Ju Q. So uh, this is June 1944, and this is October 1944. And of course, horizontal Japanese was read this way at the time, as I keep explaining every single time. Quick look in some of these. Very thin, of course, by this time because of uh, paper shortages. And uh, very badly printed. It looks like a 3D picture, but it's not. It's just really badly printed. All the colours are off register. Uh, how some sort of radio location thing works, possibly to find submarines or to guide bombers. Um, some stories, articles, inevitable samurai story as always. Some uh, articles about various soldiers, sailors, airmen, I don't know if they're like people who recently got medal, medals, recently died in heroic circumstances and so on. More stories, picture of some factory workers making uh, war materials. Very ghostly, poor quality printing of the wash illustrations. More samurai stuff. Uh, some cartoons about everyday life and wartime preparations. Got the uh, shrapnel hoods. Like padded, um, you can still buy these actually, I just did recently discovered. But um, they're like a thick hood you tie around your head and they were meant to protect from shrapnel. You can still buy them if there's earthquakes, although um, obviously more people prefer the plastic hard hats these days. Carefully put this one back in. Uh, maybe later, I'll take up too much time in the video. Try not to make this ridiculously long either. And here's one with a, an air raid warden and some adverts on the back. You could still buy stuff at the time. I've got another magazine somewhere from much uh, possibly November, December 1944, possibly January 1945. And there's no advert on the back, it's just like let's fight harder because by that time there was hardly any factories. So there was no consumer goods to consume, so they didn't even bother advertising. Let's put that over there. Okay, right, last Japanese thing is this. It's Lone Wolf and Cub, a American edition from 1989. And uh, they've resisted the temptation to colorize it. So it's still in black and white, although it's been blown up to the uh, American size. And it's just one chapter per month in the American format. That's uh, 64 interior pages, I believe, yep. So yeah, this is, um, at the time, an early example of manga coming to the USA. And they didn't really know how to do it, so sometimes they colorized it, but they always kind of blew it up to American size and published it one chapter a month. Though, of course, because it's a uh, sane in the original anthology it was in probably published uh, one chapter a month. Whether that was amongst many other stories by uh, Kazuo Koike and Goseki Kojima. And this cover is made in the USA. So, um, yeah, because obviously in the original serialization it would have been one chapter a month in an anthology. Lone Wolf and Cub wasn't always on the cover. So um, they've had to come up with new colour covers for each of these American editions. And uh, no adverts on the back, just like a thing you get on a book, a blurb. And um, oh, it all f um, flopped as well, so it opens this way. So uh, that brings us on to something interesting over here. Right. So uh, yeah, the early wave of uh, manga being released in the USA. Somebody thought, oh, I know, they have comics in Hong Kong as well. Why don't we try blowing those up to American size and releasing them? So, boom, they did. So this is um, the, published by Jade Man Comics, which is actually a um, Hong Kong comics publisher, I believe. If uh, what I can remember from reading about reading about Hong Kong comics in a book is true. Jade Man was a big cover, um, big company then, and uh, this one uh, illustrated and written by Ma Wing Xing, but um, 
scripts by Mike Barron of a Florida man fame. So I don't know if the script means he um that they translated it to English and then he refined like got a native speaker to refine the script or if this was a uh, Hong Kong and USA collaboration. It's called The Blood Sword and it's they've kept in the um Chinese title uh too. But anyway, these have been colorized from the original black and white that they would have been but the colorization has actually been done quite well so uh they haven't just kind of made it really bright and garish they've actually done like um, some nice maybe airbrush or early cg coloring like soft subtle tones and gradients and some of these like um one color wash colors so the uh, coloring is actually quite sympathetic to the um to how these would have originally been in black and white and a, a great deal of like kung fu gun fu uh, blow by blow scenes of fighting and yeah pretty cool some of the dialogues kind of like a, a bit cheesy and kind of weird like it's been translated a bit too literally people explaining their um explaining the names of their techniques as they as they use them but yeah pretty good yeah loads of this blow by blow action and uh, yeah nicely sympathetic coloring to the original black and white work so uh, pretty cool so we've got a right, go through all of these we've got the blood sword with uh, some some contribution by mike baron of florida man thing i've got florida man to hand actually i don't think so no, it's upstairs somewhere. Yeah, we've got the Blood Sword by Ma Wing Xing. Um, the Force of Buddha's Palm by um, I don't know. Oh, they're all uh, they're all by Tony Wong or is it Joni Wong? Because it's a J. But I think it's like Tony Wong. Is the uh, guy from Hong Kong? There was a report of him going to a convention in the back of one of these. Going to a Isha, going to a convention in the USA. I don't know which one it's in. Oh, yeah, these um, yeah, the uh, letter pages are a bit weird. I think the people who wrote the letter pages or like um prepared the letter pages were not very good at English. So there's um, so like if somebody was from um. Las Vegas from Hevada. So you can see how like, the A wasn't properly joined, so they assumed it was a U. And the N in Nevada maybe was a lowercase N with a bit of a too long H, so they assumed it was Hevada. So, um, yeah, not a yeah, weirdly prepared letters pages. So. Uh, yeah, this one is the Force of Buddha's Palm, and I've got to go for all of them. I've got to go for all of them anyway to find out the picture of the convention. Right, anyway, this one is a drunken fist, and this looks like a, a Tekken character. What was his name? Hey Hachiro or something. My mates at college, UK meaning of college, were crazy about Tekken. So more sympathetic colouring, blow by blow action. Slightly cheesy dialogue. Um, okay. No convention report in here. And one, one of the characters is called Porky. <laughs> okay. Maybe his like name was um. His name in Chinese was um. Uh, oh, here we are. Las Vegas Hevaga. <laughs> Maybe that character's name in Chinese had the uh, the character for pig pig in it which is a buta in Japanese and um yeah they um, <laughs> just translated it to porky because his name had the character of a pig or pork in it right, okay now last one is oriental heroes and I guess the convention report is in the back of this one maybe not okay it must have been in the first I'm not going, I'm not going back you just have to trust me I'll Maybe do a video about just one of these comics one day and show you the convention report for them. Yeah, they, this one's cover has some 
what the original black and art black and white artwork would have looked like. I believe Hong Kong comics were mostly published in kind of similar format to um, Japanese manga, which I also have none of the hand. Like a uh, thick books with black and white artwork with screen tone, so they kind of show an example of that here. But the interiors are all colorized. Because as I said, the uh, the colorization has been done pretty well, so um, actually goes with the artwork to some degree. Doesn't just look really crappy and weird, like some of the early attempts at colorizing manga in the USA. You get to watch me rebag all of these. Don't worry, I'll speed it up if I can uh, wrestle with Vegas Studio and work it out to actually speed up a section without ruining the continuity. Yeah, don't buy Vegas Studio by the way. Right, so that's uh, most of the Chinese comics except for this one. This is an actual Lian Huan Hua, the uh, landscape format, um, kind of like the style of picture books for young children, but with more like mature writing and stories, and a uh, landscape format. So this is a uh, Lian Huan Hua from 1982, October. And I don't know if this is from the mainland or from Hong Kong, but some of the letters look quite complicated like that one so possibly from Hong Kong or Taiwan but then some of the other letters look like they're simplified versions like uh, try and find an example so obviously a uh, simplified Chinese is used on the mainland so I'm hedging with Hong Kong or Taiwan but yeah some of them like this one it's just a bracket and then like X in the middle, which is a like a kind of trademark of simplified Chinese. Replace complicated parts with just X or like a cross. So um, yeah, I'm going to hedge um, Taiwan, but this could be from the mainland. And I think in the 80s, Lian Huan Hua were kind of already on the way out. And a lot of them were kind of adaptions of um, TV shows. So this could be an adaption of a TV series at the time. But yeah, this was on a um, 200 yen uh, table, so the sale has a piece of paper I've lost. Yeah, never mind. Right. So there's four 200 yen tables scattered around the sale, and um, each time you buy one book at them, you get a stamp. And if you buy, I think, 4,000 yen's worth of um, books from each of the four 200 yen tables, you can get a voucher for a whole 500 yen off after spending 4,000 yen. And yeah, this was sticking out of one of the 200 yen tables, so I went like uh, went back to the same place three or four times over the week the sale was on, looking for any more, but looks like this was the only one. Okay, it's, um, like we saw, American adaptions of Chinese and Japanese comics. Let's look at the actual American comics. How are we doing for time? Nearly half an hour. Get a move on. Right, this is Demon Blade by Chuck Dixon and um, um, Alex Nemo. And a yeah, very nice wash style artwork uh, throughout. And this is about a samurai who gets hold of like a cursed sword from a mad, a mad murderer. Uh, the samurai kills him and the murderer is like, before I die, promise me you'll take my sword. And he doesn't know that there's a, um, a curse on the sword that makes him hallucinate uh, that people around him are monsters or enemy ninjas or whatever. And he ended up killing his whole family on his brother's wedding day. And then, um, he travels around trying to escape the curse, but whenever he leaves the sword behind it, like comes back to to his possession and makes him kill people. So it's kind of like Stormbringer from Elric. And um, yeah, he's um, this is issue zero. Oh, okay, issue a uh, special one, but uh, Demon Blade one, the actual number one. 
So this would have been called an issue zero in more recent times. It's like an introduction to the story and he has to go and find out whoever forged the sword and put a curse on it is um, who he has to kill. And wouldn't you just know it, it was forged by a family of mad samurai so he's got to fight through his way through all of them to get to whoever put the curse on the sword. So that's a demon blade. Next is Grimjack by, from First Comics. John Ostrander and Flint Henry. And this reminds me of um reminds me a lot of a star what do you call it? Star something. Which I've gone and forgot the name of now. But um it was recently uh it was another series in the eighties and um then was more recently had a crowdfunded graphic novel made on Indiegogo. There's a I don't think the guy was like Comicscape, but it was back when Indiegogo was the no-no platform. But he crowdfunded a graphic novel of it on there. But anyway, this is a like that, but not entirely. But well, good colouring, by the way. Similar, similar colouring to those Hong Kong comics, but um, obviously this was made to be coloured. And I, I don't know if it's like set in purgatory or something, but. It says like uh, in some places science works, in some places magic works, and this guy's like a mercenary hitman, odd job man, whatever. And there's aliens and monsters and people with powers as well. There's Nexus as well. Um, yeah. This uh, this guy's dad is trying to kill his son. And his son has like joined a, a drug gang and it's like a backup, more comedic story. I don't know if it's set in the same world. I don't think so. That's no, just something different. I don't know, I think this is actually. Yeah, I think it's like a more comedic story set in the same world, but it's got like an old timey Mexico style theme as well. So yeah, this is um Oh Dreadstar, that's it. Okay, Dreadstar, that's what I was talking about. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of Dreadstar, like weird aliens and creatures in this strange world, and the guy's kind of like a mercenary hitman, odd job man type guy. <clears throat> okay, so that's a uh, Grimjack issue 59 from 89. Okay, let's go on to the like, last of the 80s indies. This is from, oh, okay, not an indie, this is a the Epic Comics imprint of Marvel, and this is Crash Ryan, which looks pretty cool. This is a, the premise is basically what the 30s thought the future was going to look like, even though it was made in the 80s. But um, somewhat disappointingly, it's also set in 1935, so they should have like um, said it in 1950 maybe, but like the 1950. The 1935, yeah, so 1950 as 1935 thought it was going to be. And yeah, it's got these weird advanced but still propeller planes. And then at the end, this, um, these gigantic planes inspired by uh, Wings Over the World from the uh, 1930s Things to Come movie. And that big plane the Soviet Union built, which I think actually flew once. The, uh, the plane that had tank cannons in it. I forgot what it was called. Mm. So it's a Crash Ryan by Ron Harris. And I've got to track down the rest of this somehow, somewhere. Don't think I'll find it just sitting around in Japan. It might be an eBay job. Okay, also found some Archie. So here is Katie Keene, the, uh, the supermodel, which is a bit weird. And uh, decidedly B-grade Archie artwork, so this cover looks quite nice, but uh, yeah, the interior artwork leaves uh, something to be desired. So yeah, she's meant to be a supermodel, but looks kind of weird and ugly. And uh, this is kind of interesting in that um, the uh, the readers contributed to this comic, so because um, she's a model, she shows off various clothes. This uh, winter outfit, outfit, summer outfit, and so on. But these were all designed by readers and like submitted, submitted by the readers, and then drawn into the comic. 
and uh, yeah, here's uh, Katie Keane herself, the uh, supermodel. Her sister, who is like, has freckles and glasses, so it's probably supposed to be the ugly one, although it actually looks more cute. And then her boyfriend, who's like this giant guy. I guess this is Katie Keane's mother, maybe. And um, yeah, all the way through. So this is like actually like a cut out and stick on a uh, fashion page, but all of these costumes are also designed by um, designed by readers. And uh, yeah, but like also just in the story as well, the clothes are all designed by readers and sent in. And uh, yeah, very 80s style for sis. <laughs> she hasn't got a name, it's just she's just called sis. <laughs> and uh, Yep, here's a whole like big montage page of all the characters. Because this is the Christmas issue for 1988. And I got this off the same stand that I got the um the Hong Kong comics and those 80s indies off. But by pure coincidence, elsewhere in the sale, I found another couple of Archie Christmas issues. These ones are from 1980. So yeah, just by pure coincidence, there was another two um, Christmas Archie comics at the sale. And um, this is Betty and Veronica's Christmas Spectacular. And uh, yeah, after the, the first day I went to the sale, it was actually pouring with rain, so they kind of closed it early. So I went over to Shake Shack in uh, Umeda and um, and uh, yeah it's kind of like a cool a cool restaurant so I was like a openly reading a Christmas Archie comic from 1980 and laughing my head off at it in the cool restaurant and everyone was glaring at me so that's Betty and Veronica and we also have Sabrina Sabrina's Christmas Magic also from 1980 I believe yes so uh, yeah, a couple of, oh, three Christmas Archies coincidentally bought from different places. Uh, I used to watch the Sabrina cartoon when I was a kid. Uh, the old Cartoon Network and uh, the Children's Channel didn't have much of their own shows back then so they showed loads of obscure old stuff. And uh, yeah, I remember the Sabrina cartoon being quite good so I'm have to look up some of it. Anyway, that's enough of those ones. I've had another Hong Kong comic. I don't know, that's a one I showed before. Right, that's Japan out of the way. Oh no, actually, before that, I mean, you forgot these. I found some cheap anime. So this is Aria the Scarlet Ammo. All 13 episodes on two, one or two discs, uh, I believe. So yeah, either the entire show or an entire series anyway. And you may notice this is actually a UK edition with the uh, BBFC rating on. So uh, yeah, I might watch that sometime. I don't even like anime that much, but um, there's only 200 yen, so why not? I've just noticed it's by Funimation, so I'm yeah, probably completely switched around, changed woke art, uh, woke dialogue maybe. Oh, this is from some time. All the copyrights are covered up. Yeah, maybe it's old enough to not be wokeified. Maybe they've actually translated it more or less accurately. Especially because it's 15, so they haven't tried to kidify it like they did with, uh, with One Piece. Hopefully, maybe. Okay, and also a uh, Dirty Pear. Nice 80s classic. This is a Canadian edition, I believe. And also 200 yen. The uh, OVA collection, I think it's 10 episodes on two discs in separate packages. Uh, yeah, 10 episodes of Dirty Pear, the uh, great classic uh, crazy 80s anime. And um, yeah, one of these still had the uh, alarm tag in it from uh, whatever shop it was bought from in Canada. So uh, I went into a uh, camping shop with it to look at the uh, solar generators and um, I set off the alarm on the way out 
and yeah, the alarm tag thing was still inside one of these DVD boxes, which is a bit weird. I had to rip that out. And um, right, so that's the Japanese ones out of the way. So the last two things are from, yep, I had to get some stuff from that country. So this is some North Korean comics, but this is actually well printed, glossy covered, because this is actually made in Japan by the uh, Chong Leon organization based in Tokyo. So it has a Japanese address on the inside. This is from 1995. And uh, they don't give a Juche date because uh, the Juche calendar had been, was, I think that was invented in 2002. But yeah, it's from uh, the Chong Leon North Korean uh, residence organization. And um, it's kind of like a many, many short um, comic strips and a few text stories and articles with very propagandized stories about North Korean history, or uh, the history of the whole peninsula, I guess, at the time. And um, yeah, lots of uh, peasant uprisings and anti foreigner revolts, which are all, I suppose, being reframed as great socialist upri uprisings to create a um, glorious brotherhood of equality. Although somehow there's also still a monarchy for centuries and centuries. See so yeah, the uh, Westerners, Chinese, Russians, Japanese, all invading Korea, being overthrown, or I guess some, possibly some domestic uprisings against tyrannical monarchs as well. And I guess all being reframed as these are uh, great uprisings of the uh, people of equality and freedom who then appoint <laughs> and then install another monarch somehow until eventually they finally did get communism for real in uh, 1945 so I guess the last few stories are about um there is the uh, American capitalists <laughs> the Americans Russians and I guess British I the um the uh the British and the Japanese deciding to carve up Korea amongst themselves, which is uh, exactly what happened. There wasn't any kind of, yeah, you know, the uh, British and Japanese never fought against each other at all, of course. So yeah, that's um, the, oh, it appears to be book three. So I guess there's another two volumes focusing on earlier history back in the day. Oh, it's actually, yeah, starts in 1863. So I guess uh, the earlier volumes go back in time, uh, fighting off Chinese invasions and the earlier Korean, uh, the earlier Japanese invasions even. I think uh, the uh, Japanese isolation period started because they uh, um, failed to invade Korea in 1590-something, so decided to just completely close their borders and isolate themselves for 250 years. I yeah, wish Britain had done the same thing instead of having an empire. We'd be so much better off now, wouldn't we? Okay, and um, right, last thing from North Korea. I think, I'm sort of sure I bought three things from North Korea, but never mind. Right, anyway, it is a bit weird. It's, boom, yes. This is Anne Frank's Diary, North Korean edition. Actually made in North Korea, so even though it's from 2002, the uh, quality of printing is actually vastly inferior to this one made in Japan in 1995. And they had the uh, Juche dating system in, so 2002 was Juche 1991. I mean, Juche 91 even. I think they count from 1912 or 1911 when um, Kim Il-sung was born. And... Um, yeah, so push out the uh, push out the Nazis, or well, actually the swastika, this way round and not tilted. It's actually more of a Hindu symbol than a Nazi one, but never mind. And this is a uh, Anne Frank's diary. So um, here is the doorway into the uh, uh, what did they call it? The uh, Het Altelix, uh, the annex, is what Anne Frank called it. That's there crude cooking facilities. Uh, the street during the German occupation and her identity documents. 
and yeah, I can't read Korean at all, of course, but um, yeah, for some reason I doubt this is an exact translation of Anne Frank's diary. It was um, uh, like she possibly made references to um, hearing about people who said the wrong thing on the street and were dragged away by the police and never seen again. And um, I guess if she wrote anything like that, I guess the North Korean translators maybe kind of cut that bit out because um, people in North Korea who read this and hear about like secret police dragging people away might start to kind of wonder about things happening in their own country. So yeah, I doubt this is an accurate translation, but uh, interesting all the same. A uh, bit of water damage because uh, it was raining and I guess some drips got on it. So I didn't buy it on the first day. First day of the sale. The uh, second day of the sale, I had a terrible hangover. The third day of the sale, it was also sunny, so I bought it then when it was dry. Okay, so that's uh, the haul of this year's um, Shit Energy sale. Oh, yeah, also, I got a book about how to draw ships from uh, the UK in the 1960s because it's five shillings, and um, yeah. Some advice for drawing modern and old ships and uh, also kind of importantly drawing water which is always kind of a, a bit annoying to do. Yeah, there's a big storm so like the reflections and I'm um, breaking up of the fairly calm water is always kind of annoying to get right. I can never make it look convincing. And also this costume through the ages from Roman times up to I think about 1918 or something, and oh, no, then I think 1930 actually. So, 1927 to 28, okay. Mostly kind of a, in more modern times, kind of a Sunday best costumes. Not necessarily what a factory labourers would be wearing, like that. <laughs> I suppose match sellers wore clothes like that. And then uh, from the ancient times, so a lot of a, uh, what kings and queens were wearing, or really rich aristocrats because it's based on paintings and statues so not entirely useful for everyday working class stories but um, it'll do I suppose. Oh and also this Famicom game, uh, Twin B. don't know what that's like. And um, the next event I want to go to is a Kansai Committee which is an event for this stuff, Originado, original Dojinshi, like this one. But um, uh, new ones you can actually buy from the people who made them. And Committee is a convention dedicated even entirely to original ones, not based on any pre-existing uh, anime or manga or game or anything. And um, Committee started in Tokyo and um, it's also in Kansai, Nagoya, I think there's one in Kyushu as well. So there's several committees and I'm going to this, uh, no not this. Right, start again. Okay, so anyway, Kansai Committee. I'm going to this Kansai Committee number 64. Oh, it's got a message on my tablet. But, oh, that's some um, comic treasure. That's not until September. That's a, uh, yeah, Kansai Committee 64, which is on May 22nd, so next Sunday, or one week's time from the time I'm recording this. So uh, I got my ticket to Committee, and here it is. This is a, you know, a lot of the um, comic conventions in Japan have a catalogue or guide to the um, different exhibitors. So here's a, a, a map of the convention, the areas split up by genre, and then um, the table numbers. Look, here we are, the uh, table numbers and um, names of the makers, the groups or individuals who make the comics, and then like a sketch they've done to give an example of their artwork. And uh, these catalogues are also the tickets to the convention. So here's the actual ticket. You can fill in and they rip it out and give you the wristband on the day, I'm guessing. This is actually going to be my first 
a comic convention in Japan. So we'll see, we'll do a video about that. You can't film or take pictures at all inside the venue, but I'm, I guess I'll get some B-roll from the outside and do a, um, do a haul video. And we've got various articles, letters, blah, 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 mini comic strips from uh, the different contributors and uh, lots of mention of like we're overcoming Corona because obviously the committee has have been cancelled the past few years and uh, yeah these articles and stuff adverts for other other events around Kansai and other committees and then the big uh, circle guide so yep that's my uh, ticket to committee which I'll go to next week so that should be a interesting experience and video and I need to start going over this with a highlighter picking out the um, the circles I want to go to. It's not actually open for that long. It uh, starts at 11 and I think it only runs till 4 or 5. So there's no time to go around all of the tables. Especially because uh, I hear Japanese comic cons get like really long queues. That's mostly a uh, comicette, the really big one, but I guess some of the bigger makers at Committee get quite long queues as well. So I'm going to go around highlighting artwork I like or things that look like like <laughs> like these two it's like a, it's, you can't tell much and the artwork doesn't look particularly good so I guess no one's well not many people are going to go to their tables so they probably won't have much of a queue so I might go to tables like that just to buy one copy of their thing just so they get a ego boost at least we sold one issue to somebody and yeah so start highlighting the ones I actually want to visit and see how many I can get around. And yeah, that's going to be a committee. Pretty fun, I'm guessing. I'll see. So that's it for this video and um, more to come uh, whenever.